good to see everybody here this morning. Certainly pray for the Lord's blessing on our meeting together. Let's take our course books and turn to page 8. Page 8. And uh, we'll sing this hymn, Complete in Thee. Complete in Thee, no work of mine may take, dear Lord, the place of Thine. Thy blood hath pardoned but for me, and I am now complete in Thee. Yea, justified, O oh, blessed thought, and sanctified salvation wrought. Thy blood hath pardoned but for me, and Salem also is his tabernacle and his dwelling place in Zion. There break he the arrows of the bow, the shield, the sword, and the battle. Selah. Thou art more glorious and excellent than the mountains of prayer. The stout-hearted are spoiled. They have slept their sleep, and none of the men of might have found their hands. If thy rebuke, O God of Jacob, both the chariot and horse are cast into a deep sleep. Thou, even thou, art to be feared, and who may stand in thy sight once thou art angry? Thou didst cause judgment to be heard from heaven, the earth feared and was still. When God arose to judgment to save all the meek of the earth, Selah, surely the wrath of man shall praise thee, the remainder of wrath shall thou restrain. Vow and pay unto the Lord your God. Let all that be round about him bring presents unto him that ought to be feared. He shall cut off the spirit of the princes. He, shall, he is terrible to the kings of the earth. We pray. 
Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to read your word, dear Lord. Open our eyes to see Christ, the glory, the righteousness, dear Lord, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Be we can as he brings forth the message this morning in Jesus' name. Let's take our bulletins and on the inside cover we'll sing this hymn to the tune of Brethren We Have Met Together. Lamb of God, we fall before Thee, humbly trusting in Thy cross. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and every one that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is true. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in the earth, the spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God has the witness in himself. He that believeth not God has made him a liar because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that has the Son has life, and he that has not the Son of God has not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. 
And if we know that he heareth us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. If any man see his brother sin, a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God is come, and has given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from all idols. Amen. Let's pray. <coughs> Father God, we come before you now and we praise you and thank you. Lord, let us also realize that God ordained and purposes all things. Nothing happens outside of the will of God. We have eternal life in Christ Jesus. He is the resurrection in our life. Lord, we pray that we understand that believing is not the cause of salvation. It's the result of salvation. We look to Christ always. Be with Brother Ken as he delivers the word. Open our hearts to receive it. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Well, let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 266. Faith, faith, each earthly joy. Jesus is mine. Break every tender tie, Jesus is mine. Dark is the wilderness, earth has no resting place. Jesus alone can bless, Jesus is mine. Tempt not my soul away, Jesus is mine. Here would I ever stay, Jesus is mine. Irishing things of clay, born but for one brief day. Pass from my heart away, Jesus is mine. Farewell, ye dreams of night, Jesus is mine. Lost in this dawning bright, Jesus is mine. All that my soul has tried left but a dismal void. Jesus has satisfied. Jesus is mine. Farewell, mortality. Jesus is mine. Welcome eternity, Jesus is mine. Welcome, O oh loved and blessed. Welcome, sweet scenes of rest. Welcome, my Savior's breast, Jesus is mine. David, come read for us, please. John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. 
Whosoever sins ye remit, they were remitted unto them. Whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Father, we're thankful we can gather in your name to read and study your word. The Spirit directs us to see Christ, even though we don't see him in the physical form. Help us always to rejoice in the name of Christ and give him all the praise. Amen. Let's keep our place right here in John 20, verses 19 to 31. And I want to speak with you on what it is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Some might say, well, that's simple as ABC. And we'll see that expressed today by many. They say A is accept, B is believe, and C is confess. That's it. But what does believing look like to you? First of all, based on the Word of God, because any true faith must be founded upon what God has to say in His Word. But secondly, I would ask you, what has your life of faith looked like? I dare say if we were to plot it on a chart, it would not be looking like this exponentially going up. If it were charted properly, probably some ups and downs and more downs and ups. And I struggled this, with this myself for a long time, thinking what's wrong with me? If I have faith, why does that faith not manifest itself better and better and greater and greater every day? Well, if it did, then we would probably become very presumptuous in thinking that somehow we're okay. I believe the Lord purposes that our faith be weak. And yet, those that he came to save, he never abandons. And if you want a good example of faith, we're looking at it right here in these disciples, first of all, that when the Lord, after his resurrection, came to them, where were they? Locked up in a room and fearful. And yet at that time, they were no less his than had they been with him all those years and seen him for who he was. And it says they believed. And then you've got the example of Thomas. Oh, how people like to beat Thomas down. Doubting Thomas. How many messages have you heard? Well, I'd have to say that's me. How many times have I, even though all that I know concerning Christ and what he's revealed, found myself to be doubting and needing a fresh view of Christ once again. And then thirdly, we see here in the example that Christ gives of any that are brought to believe on him. The pattern that we find here is for our exhortations, for our learning. And I will say this, and that's why I specifically put the title of the message the way I did, Believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter described it in this way over in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. If you'd like to look there with me. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. 
is believing a one and done. Can we say, well, I believed, and so therefore I'm saved? Well, 1 Peter chapter 2, the way Peter describes it here is in the present tense. Notice he says there, first of all, in verse 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. What's the sign of life? It's hunger, hungering and thirsting after Christ. Why do we hunger? Because the body gets weak. Without the food, we would die. And so that hunger is a reminder we need to eat. Just as in times when our faith is weak and we don't see Christ as clearly as we know we should, yet why does God purpose those times that we might ever seek after him? If so be, it says in verse 3, that ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. In other words, this is how he deals with any of his children, where he has manifest his grace. How do we know he's manifest that grace in us? There will be that need to constantly seek Christ, learn of him, feed on him. And that's why Peter puts it there in verse 4. Notice, in the present tense, to whom coming. It doesn't say to whom I came, and so all is well. No, to whom coming. There's never going to be a day that we don't need these hearts drawn to Christ. And continually so, that we might believe on him. So what I want to do in this text here in John 20 Divide this up in three parts. First of all, to see the example of believing as manifest here in the ten disciples. I say ten disciples because the first time, and we touched on this last time toward the end, but the first time Thomas wasn't there. Does not explain why he wasn't. I tend to take the side of Thomas here that perhaps... He was not like these others that felt that they needed to be locked up in a room somewhere. Obviously, he was out and about. And uh, living in uh, that state in which God had put him at this time. God deals with each of us differently. But he wasn't there. And then, of course, we know that Judas was not there because Judas had gone and hanged himself. So here in... Uh, my text in verses 20 to 23, we have an example of these 10 disciples. And you might say, well, how is that an example of faith? Well, they did not stop believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that John particularly had been there when the Lord was crucified. And the witness had gone forth. John and Peter had both run to the tomb to see that it was empty. And they had heard the angel say, he's not here, he is risen. He's gone before you into Galilee. And yet, here they were waiting on the Lord, but doing so in fear. The object of true faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is who he is and what he accomplished in his death on the cross. Whether we see it plainly or not, it's nonetheless the, he is nonetheless the object of our faith. Do I see it as clearly as I ought? No. Are there times when I don't see it so clearly? Yes. And yet the Lord never abandons his own. And so here we find with our Lord Jesus Christ, him meeting these disciples, you go back up to verse 19, the same day being the first day of the week. So this is fresh after Christ's resurrection. He found the doors shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. They hadn't abandoned the Lord. They had met here in this room for fear of 
the noise going about, perhaps that some of them might be arrested, and the Lord purposed that they be gathered there. But the eye of our Lord was never off of them because he found them where they were in all of Jerusalem. Here they were in this place, and it says Jesus stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. Now, would the Lord speak peace unto any who were not his? Absolutely not. I know we've got preachers today that go about trying to speak peace to anybody and everybody, but only the Lord can speak peace. And here it has to do with his reconciling work that he accomplished on the cross. That's why he had died. That's why he was buried those three days. That's why he arose again on behalf of such as these. Weak, yes. Fearful, yes. And yet, nonetheless, the Lord's. And so we dare not think that because we're weak or we're fearful that somehow the Lord has abandoned us. He hasn't. And verse 20 clearly shows us how the Lord himself strengthens the faith of those that are his. What did he do? Verse 20 says, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Now, he's not physically here to show unto any one of us his hands and his side, but by the Spirit of God, we see what his hands and his side represent. That, those represent the wounds with which he was wounded. And it represents, if he died for me, my sin that he bore in his body on that tree. And we don't find the Lord here scolding them or whipping them. What are you doing here and why he knows our nature. He knows his sheep. He knows us better than we know ourselves. But what does he do? He points them as needy sinners unto himself. And I'll tell you, this is the work of the grace of God in dealing with those that he gave to his son and for whom his son came and paid the sin debt. He will continue in our time of weakness and fearfulness and doubt. Draw us again and again to look to him that was crucified. That's where the spirit always draws a sinner's heart. And so we're not taught here how you're supposed to bolster up again your faith when you're fearful. Find your friends and let's get together and encourage one another. They were, they were all friends. They had followed the Lord those three and a half years. And yet none of that could help them apart from the Lord appearing unto them and revealing himself again unto them so that they might be strengthened in that faith that was already there because faith is the gift of God and it is given to those for whom the Lord Jesus Christ came. When the Lord said, peace be unto you, he was expressing to them the very blessing of what his work had accomplished on their behalf. When we think of peace, what does that mean? We're talking about reconciliation with God, a holy God. And how effectual was the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on behalf of those sinners for whom he came? Well, peace means my sins are forgiven. Forgiven, all of them, past, present. You realize at the time Christ died, my sins were all still future. Everything that I have ever known in my life, from my conception all the way till now, has been nothing but sin. But all of that was already forgiven in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where forgiveness is. It's not in how clearly I see it because we're still threatened by our flesh and the thoughts of this flesh and whenever we consider our sinfulness we we're quickly weighed down but there there's the hope is in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ when he said peace be unto you that means the slavery of that sin has been broken 
There is therefore now what? No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Peace means it's the Savior who gives us that peace. And in time of fear and doubt, we see him caring for us even more so than we could ever care for ourselves. But when I hear peace too, <laughs> I hear a settled matter. It's like a court case. Once the judge bangs his gavel and says, case closed, he's free to go. Mr. Weimer, free to go. There's therefore now no condemnation. My case has been settled now forever. That's an amazing thing. Yes, when I look within, I find much for which to condemn me, but God sees no reason or case for condemnation. Why? Because that matter has been settled by the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's that external objective peace of reconciliation with God, but then he gives that inward peace as our eyes are turned to him and consider his death when he showed unto them his hands and his side. I will say unto you, may the Lord direct your eyes and my eyes to him that was crucified because therein is the peace of God. And then immediately, verse 21, they didn't have to go off to some religious school somewhere, some Bible institute in order to be prepared now to be sent out into the world. Here immediately the Lord Jesus said unto them, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. You stop and think about what these apostles were about to face now in being sent out into the world to represent the Lord Jesus Christ. They weren't going to remain in that room locked up. This gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and his death is not to be held back. It's not to be taken and put under a bushel or hidden somewhere. We don't meet to hear this gospel in secret here and then hold it to ourselves as we go out those doors. No, even here Christ said, peace be unto you. Were they weak? Yes. And yet it was going to be the Lord that was going to strengthen them to go forth and testify of his person and his worth, work. And this is an amazing thing where he says, as my father has sent me, even so send I you. You stop and think about how the father had sent Christ into this world. He didn't come as a philosopher. He didn't come with some higher teaching then that uh, he brought into the world and nor are, nor are we sent out into the world to be philosophers or educators with regard to Christ and his death. He wasn't sent as some inventor or discoverer even though he was the creator of the world. We're not sent out to come up with some new thing to communicate unto the world. He was sent into the world to, first of all, lay down his life, live that perfect life necessary that God might be just to justify when he laid down his life. He earned and established a righteousness and then laid down his life to pay the sin debt. And when we're sent out into the world, we're not sent out to talk about works or building up man's righteousness as if somehow there's some good in man there's not no we're sent out even as he was sent to declare christ as that righteousness even as he declared himself and even as christ suffered because he declared who he was we going out in the world can expect also persecution and suffering People are not going to persecute you because of being a good neighbor or looking after somebody in their time of need. The hatred and disdain that was toward the Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to feel. That's what Christ said. Even as my Father sent me, so send I you. you say, why do people get so upset about talking about 
Christ being the only righteousness that God has accepted. Well, it's because people are proud of their own. They think they have something to offer. And that's their very condemnation. So even as Christ came into the world to save sinners, those that the Father had given him. So as we go out into the world, even these apostles, they were to go out with no other message than Christ and him crucified. And that work that he came to accomplish. Now to do that, they were certainly going to need the strengthening of the Spirit, just like any one of us. If we're going to testify of Christ, it's not going to be by natural strength in our flesh, but it's by the Spirit strengthening us and opening our mouth and giving us the word to speak in a timely manner. And that's what we read here in verse 22. When he had said this, he breathed on them. That's the same word that you find over Paul writing to Timothy about the scriptures being inspired. It means God breathed. And that's the word we have here. And said unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now when he's saying this, it's in the context of them being strengthened now. Because here they are in this room, all locked in, fearful of the Jews. And the Lord's now saying, you need to get out there and start declaring that he's not here, he's risen. And declare what he has accomplished. But to do that, it's going to take the Spirit of God. So when he says, receive ye the Holy, Holy Ghost, it's not in the sense of conversion, because obviously the Holy Spirit was already at work in them, drawing them to Christ. But receive ye the Holy Ghost, much as what the Lord told them after he ascended over in Acts chapter 1. If you look there, Acts chapter 1. And this is not a one-time receiving of the Holy Ghost. I need the Spirit of God to empower me every time I stand up to preach. I quiver to think that the Lord would ever put me here to declare this gospel and his presence not be with me. I can't tell you how many times I have sought the Lord and asked him to strengthen me one more time to stand up and declare the truth of Christ. Sometimes to a, an audience that is ready and been prepared to hear, but many times to an audience that doesn't want to hear it. I've preached in situations where I've literally seen people, their, their jaws cranking because of their disdain for a message that gives Christ all the glory and none to man. It takes the Spirit of God. And this is what Christ told the disciples after he ascended. He told them to go and wait in Jerusalem. And verse 8 says, And ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You say, well, he already breathed on them and they've received the Spirit, so why would they need to go and wait? Because we need the Spirit every day, just like we need breath every day. Sometimes we get short of breath. And you have to pause and, and take in more breath, breathe more easily, that's physically, but how much more so spiritually. Here he says, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem. That was a hostile place. At the time when the Lord sent the disciples out to preach, Jerusalem was still reeling under everything that had taken place. The hatred of the Jews was still there. And just because now they couldn't get their hands on Christ, they would get, try to get their hands on the apostles. And that's why you read here in Acts, there was such a great persecution that came. Even though the Lord continued to bless, Peter preached on a day of Pentecost and over 3,000 were brought to Christ. And as you continue to read in verse 8, the persecution became so great in Jerusalem that the church was scattered out into the regions beyond. Well, that's how God purposed that this word be carried out from there. And that's what we read here. Beginning in Jerusalem, but then in all Judea and Samaria, and what? Under the uttermost parts of the earth. That's how God purposed that this would go forth. But it took the receiving of the Spirit to do that. 
and the enabling, the empowering of the Spirit of God. And so we still need today. I'm thankful that the Spirit continues to be at work in those that today are carrying forth this gospel message, though we be not many. <laughs> I'd love to run into a few. I run into a lot of preachers, but in listening to them, they've been running, but they haven't been sent because they don't identify with this Christ of the scriptures, giving him all the glory. It's a mixed message. Here's what Jesus has done, now here's what you have to do. No, it's all on who, what he has done. Now verse 23 then is the message as they go forth to declare, and this message, I believe, has been a puzzle to some and an abuse to others as they read it, because he tells his apostles, whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. And so we have those today that call themselves apostles that make people believe that all the power of forgiveness is in their hands. And that's why people go to them. That's why they confess to them in hopes that they'll receive the blessing of being forgiven by these men. And they'll come back to a verse like this to justify what they do. But if you stop and consider what the Lord Jesus Christ has sent them to do, what has he sent them to do? Preach the gospel. He said, even as my Father has sent me, so send I you. He came declaring the truth. <clears throat> he came declaring himself as God's righteousness. And this is the message that the apostles then were to go and carry forth. So how is it then that it can be said, whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. Not even Christ prayed for the world. He said that, I pray not for the world, but for those that thou hast given me. So even today, the power to declare unto sinners that their sins have been put away is in declaring that if the Lord Jesus Christ paid your sin debt, your sins are forgiven. No ifs, ands, or buts. And I believe that's how we preach the gospel. I don't know who those are that Christ has died to save and has saved. We find out about it as the gospel is preached. But I can clearly stand and declare that any sinner for whom the Lord Jesus Christ has paid their sin debt, their sins are forgiven. Your sins are remitted. You, if you are one of those for whom the Lord Jesus Christ laid down his life. And some will say, well, you know, you got to be careful there because they have to prove it with their lives and all these things. No. The scriptures declare that if Christ has put away your sin, they're put away. And there is therefore now no condemnation. Yes, he'll draw you to himself in his time, give you that faith to look to him. But on the other hand, when it says, whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. I can just as boldly say in declaring this gospel, just like the apostles were sent out to declare, that any that do not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, as he is set forth in scripture, you will die in your sin. That's what Christ said. If ye believe not that I am, he was provided in our text as if to read, if you don't believe that I am he, but... He is an italic. In the, in the Greek, it's, if you believe not that I am, you will die in your sin. And I can declare that just as boldly as I preach the gospel, that any that are not brought to Christ and do not bow to him as the only Savior and substitute for sin, your sins are retained. That means those sins have never been put away. And you will suffer eternally because of your own sin. And Christ didn't have to die for everybody. God didn't have to show grace to everybody. 
but those for whom he has been gracious. They are the Lord's forever because the Lord has come and paid their sin debt. That's what we see over in Mark chapter 16. If you look there in Mark 16, it confirms what I've just told you. So again, that verse is not saying that any Tom, Dick, and Harry can stand up and say, well, your sins aren't forgiven you, and I'll never forgive them. And if I don't forgive them, you can't be forgiven. There's people that live under that bondage. And so they're constantly cowering, whether it's a priest or a pastor. If they haven't got the pastor's favor, then, then they, they fear somehow they've committed the unpardonable sin. No, our dealing with, with God in salvation is holy in the work of Christ. That's what the gospel declares and what he's accomplished. But if he has not paid your sin debt, and you continue to try to come in any other way, one thing's for sure, your sins have not been put away. Never were. And the only evidence that they have been is if the Lord is pleased in his time to draw you to himself. Here in Mark 16 and verse 15, this was before our Lord ascended, he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, so there it is. Even as I, my Father sent me, so send I you. And preach the gospel to every creature. Notice, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Some people look at that and say, ah, see, you still need baptism. No, it doesn't say in the second part, but he that believeth not and is not baptized shall be damned. Baptism was the way that God ordained that sinners confess the Lord Jesus Christ. And that word means to be immersed. So he that believeth and is immersed. In other words, the believing is identifying with Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. That's what you do in the waters of baptism. That is an indication of salvation. Because you'd never believe were it not that Christ had paid your sin debt. But he that believeth not. That's talking about those that left to themselves. They die as they've lived. They have no interest at all in Christ and his death. Well, they shall be damned. And that's the declaration that Christ has given here to his apostles as they go forth. It's in the preaching of the gospel. It's not in the preacher going around and looking at this one and saying, well, your sins are forgiven, but no, your sins can never be forgiven. People cower under that sort of false teaching today. No, it's all in the gospel. The declaration of sins forgiven in Christ and damnation in trying to come in any other way. It's pretty clear. So that's the first evidence of faith, of believing, because the Lord did not leave these ten to themselves. Found them, strengthened them, and then sent them out. And uh, what a strengthening it was, because every one of the apostles ended up laying down their lives in time over this testimony of Christ. And yet it was the Spirit that strengthened them, that even in the face of such opposition, they would not declare any other message. Paul said that, it'd be better to be anathema than to come preaching any other message. But second example, again, looking at believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, we come to Thomas, come back to our text here in John 20. Thomas wasn't there when the Lord had said this to these other apostles. Does that mean he was excluded? No. In fact, if you read the history of Thomas, they say he went to India to preach. They got as far as India and ended up dying a martyr in India. This was way back in the beginning. You can read that in, in history. But that doesn't mean then because Thomas wasn't at this meeting that somehow the Lord had cast him off. I love that word in verse 24. But, Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord, but he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger in his, into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. There's where some look at that and call him Doubting Thomas. But in reality, he was declaring the necessity 
himself, not based on the testimony of these others, but of seeing the Lord himself. And I dare say that as I have been taught of the Lord over the years, that has been my desire. I don't want my faith to be based upon what others say about the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that he give me a fresh view of who he is and his death, and thereby I can believe. Otherwise, there is no belief. And I believe that's really what he was saying there. Unless I can myself put my finger in, into the print of, of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, eight days goes by, verse 26. Eight days. You wonder what he was thinking during that time. And yet, when it says the, his disciples were within, this time it became a gathering place for them to meet, to encourage one another, a place of worship. You get over in Acts chapter 1, there was an upper room somewhere where the numbers continued to grow. It wasn't just the, the, the ten, but others that met with them, even Mary and Christ's brethren. To a number of 120 at one point that were meeting together. So here, after eight days, the disciples were within. Again, they were... They were meeting together. It doesn't say the doors were locked and that they were fearful of the Jews this time. They were meeting in the freeness of that same spirit that had been breathed upon them as they had seen the Lord and rejoiced in seeing him. But now Thomas, who was with them there this time, then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and what? Stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. If you want to know a meeting that's blessed of the Lord, it's where the Lord is pleased to meet with his people. <clears throat> that's my same prayer here. We come in, we shut the doors, and uh, we shut out the world. But it's just a meeting unless the Lord's pleased to be with us. And I pray that he does gather with us. Where two or three are gathered in his name, there he is in their midst. Now, it's interesting, he had not heard Thomas say this, but as soon as Thomas was there, the first person that the Lord spoke to was Thomas. He didn't scold him. He didn't say, hey, Thomas, you really missed a blessing that last meeting. Like some preachers like to do, if you don't show up for a meeting, boy, they're all over you. Well, you really missed a blessing. You know, that doesn't mean that they're not the Lord's. I thank the Lord for those he does bring. I thank the Lord I can be here. But there's times when you might not be able to. But that doesn't mean you're any less the Lord's. But here, when he spoke to Thomas, the very thing that Thomas had said in private, now the Lord, knowing his thoughts, said, reach hither thy finger. Behold my hands. Reach hither thy hand. And thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. You see how he put it there? That means there had to be faith there to believe. And it was, but it took the Lord to strengthen it that he might continue to believe on him. Now, we don't find where time, Thomas runs up and says, okay, let me touch and feel. No, as soon as he heard the word of the Lord, what does it say? Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. What is it that turns our heart from faithlessness again to seeing Christ for who he is and the death that he accomplished? It's his word. If he'll but speak the word. And I, I have people even to this day that still write me. They struggle. They don't know whether they're the Lord's or not. I can't just speak a word of peace. But what I can do is say, may the spirit of God give you eyes to look to Christ. And him crucified. Because this I know. It's a faithful saying. Worthy of all acceptation. That Jesus Christ came into the world. To save sinners. Of whom I am chief. You wonder why he's pointing out to you. Just how chief of sinners you are. Well guess what. It's that the glory of Christ's death. Shine all the more gloriously. In your soul. Whether others see it or not. And that's all it took for, for Thomas. He didn't need any more evidence or proof than that than for the Lord himself to speak the word 
And uh, the Lord saying to him, do not be unbelieving. Quit acting like an unbeliever. <laughs> we have so much unbelief in our flesh. But oh, when we have a fresh view of Christ, that's where we stop in that unbelief. And uh, we declare him for who he is, he is, my Lord and my God. What a gracious Savior he is. Now, here's where we see an example of faith in all who have ever believed on Christ and do believe on him. Here the Lord said to Thomas in verse 29, Because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. It does take seeing Christ. And it does take the Lord revealing himself. You see, sight requires not only eyes, but light. And that's why he declared that light was in him. My Lord, my God. But now is where this word is addressed to others like ourselves. Just like Christ said in John 17. He didn't pray just for his disciples, but for those that should believe on him through their preaching, their word. Why he says, blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. You know who that is? That's us sitting right here. I've never seen Christ in person. I've seen people's designs and drawings of who he is. And I look at it and think, that's just man's design. You know, Peter wrote about whom having not seen yet believing. I love that. Because that's where my faith is. It's not in a physical Christ. I don't want another person's drawing or image of Christ to be what's impressed in my mind. I wait to see him as he is. And that's our hope of glory, that we shall see him as he is. But until then, not having seen him, what? We believe. We believe. That's an example of true believing. We don't need the physical evidence. We don't need a fresh vision of who the Lord Jesus Christ is. We have his word. And that's who the Lord calls blessed here. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. When people ask you, well, how do you know these things are so? How can you be so sure? Well, we believe it because it's declared here in this word. And the spirit is the one that has given us life to believe on him. That's why John concluded there in 30 and 31, many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe. Not just begin believing, but continue to believe that Jesus is the Christ. He's the anointed one, the one who came and fulfilled all the types and pictures of the Old Testament. The Son of God. And that believing... And that word is in the present tense, continuing to believe you might have life through his name. Continue to have life through his name. That's the example of faith there that is given of any today whom the Lord has taught. These are written. What do we have as our foundation of faith? What is written? That's why we have this Bible. And that's why we read it and study it and I preach it. It's because it's the word of God. We don't need the signs. We don't need Christ to come back and perform the miracles that he did. It says here there were many other miracles that could not even be written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ. You know, when the Lord dressed Peter and asked whom do men say that I am. And they gave all kinds of opinions like we have today. You'll go out there, who's Jesus? Everybody's got an opinion. But who do you say I am? And that's where Peter declared, thou art the Christ. Same thing as John's saying here. Believe that Jesus is the Christ. The son of the living God. And what did the Lord say to him? Peter, flesh and blood haven't revealed that unto you. But my father which is in heaven. Blessed art thou. Same thing here. Blessed are they. Our believing is not the cause of our salvation, but it is the result. It's the fruit. It's the evidence that God has been merciful to me, a sinner. Well, I commend each of us to the Lord. 
because believing on the Lord Jesus Christ is not a work of our flesh. It's the work of the Spirit in the hearts of those that Christ has come and redeemed. And if we've been redeemed, we've been justified. And if we've been justified, we've been sanctified through that shed blood. And if we've been sanctified, that means we're kept. And we'll be preserved in this faith until the end. Let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 224. We'll stand and sing this together. And again, it's not I know what I have believed, but I know whom I have believed. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not how this saving grace to me he did impart, nor how believing in his work brought peace within my heart. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not how the Spirit moves, convincing men of sin, revealing Jesus through his word, creating faith in him. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not what of good or ill may be reserved for me of weary ways or golden days before his face I see. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not when my Lord may come at night or noonday fair, nor if I walk the veil with him or meet him in the air. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Amen. All right. We'll be dismissed. Look forward to the next time. Lord willing. <laughs>